to National Plant Biology Unit 3 Life on Earth. So today we're going to be looking at Kyria 3, which is photosynthesis, a part that some people find quite difficult, but if we just break it down into sections, it's not actually too bad. So let's get started. So hopefully before you started National 5, you came across the sort of basic photosynthesis equation. So where water and uh, carbon dioxide are taken into the plant and through light energy and chlorophyll, the plant produces oxygen and sugar. Oxygen which is released so we can breathe in and sugar that is needed for the plant to have energy and to grow and to survive. Although this is correct, we have to look into it into a bit more detail in National 5. So to start off with, this light that we've talked about being absorbed from the sun that you've came across before, plants need light, that sort of thing. Hopefully you remember from cell structure, so the, the first key area of unit 1, that plants have uh, chloroplasts. In these chloroplasts they have these little green pigments called chlorophyll and this is what is used to absorb light energy. That light energy is going to be very important for photosynthesis so it's a good starting point. So let's go on to the process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis itself is a two-stage process and you need to know the names of the stages, you need to know what happens in each stage, how they relate to each other and you'll be able to both create and identify diagrams of both these stages. What I've done on this slide is just a brief overview of what happens in each stage but then we'll go into a bit more detail in both the stages as well. So stage one is known as light reactions, this because light energy is used extensively through stage one. So basically, the light from the sun is captured in the chlorophyll, then converted into chemical energy in order to make ATP, which is the energy required for the rest of these processes. At the same time, water is split in order to make hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen from this and the ATP that are produced are then used in stage 2, which is known as carbon fixation. Carbon fixation involves carbon dioxide, hence the name. One of the really, part, really important parts of stage two is that carbon fixation is a series of enzyme-controlled reactions which use hydrogen and ATP from the light reactions along with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to make sugar, which is the end point of photosynthesis, the point of photosynthesis to actually do. So let's look at stage one in a bit more detail. So as I've said, this light energy from the sun is captured by chlorophyll, which is found in the chloroplasts of plant cells. It's then converted into chemical energy, and this is then used to generate ATP, which is going to be the energy for the rest of this process to take place. At the same time though, we have water that is taken to a plant through its roots. Light energy is used in order to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Now, this is quite obvious when you think about it because the chemical formula of water is H2O, so it's made up of hydrogen and oxygen. This light energy is used to split the H2O into H and O. This process is known as photolysis, which basically just means light splitting, so splitting through light energy. One thing to remember as well is, although this hydrogen is going to be used and is really important for stage two, the oxygen is actually not required by the plant. We would actually call it a byproduct or a waste product. So the plant just diffuses the oxygen out of the cell, and that goes into the atmosphere, and that's the oxygen that we breathe. So if plants decided that they actually wanted to use this oxygen, and it wasn't just a waste, we'd be in a lot of trouble. This is where we get our oxygen from. So in stage two, carbon fixation, this is the series of enzyme-controlled reactions. Now, I really stress the enzyme-controlled reactions part because we'll talk about this uh, later on in this video about how the rate of these reactions can be affected and hopefully remember something about enzymes from unit one and how enzymes can be affected. However, the hydrogen ATP from stage one, light reactions, are then combined with carbon dioxide, which is just taken in from the atmosphere. So when you hear that plants breathe in carbon dioxide, this is what it's actually for. And through these reactions, the sugar is produced. You might come across it as glucose. For natural five, we just need to talk about sugar. So this sugar is now made, and we also need to look at what that sugar is going to be used for. So the sugar that is made by the plant has three different endpoints. It can be used in three different ways. So either the plant can use it immediately as an energy source, 
And this can be used in respiration, it can make more ATP for any sort of cellular resources. If you're unsure about respiration or if you've forgotten about respiration, please go back to the end of unit one and revise over that as well. If the plant isn't going to use that sugar as an energy source straight away, it can also store it. So if you think about storing energy in humans, our excess energy is stored as fat. Plants don't have fat though, instead they have starch. So these sugar molecules can join together in order to make starch. So that's when you do some of these experiments in the classroom where you're testing leaves for starch, you're looking to make sure they have stored energy. They can only store energy if they've created energy through photosynthesis in the first place. And the third and final way that sugar can be used is as a building material in order to make the plant, make parts of the plant, the plant to grow, to survive, that sort of thing. In this form, sugar is turned into long strands of cellulose. And hopefully you remember that cellulose is the main carbohydrate component of cell balls. So again, you need to know not just that sugar is made by photosynthesis or how the sugar is made through photosynthesis, you need to know what that sugar can then be used for. So remember, energy source, storage, and building material with respiration, starch, and cellulose. Next, and finally, we're going to be looking at limiting factors. So limiting factors means how the rate of photosynthesis can be slowed down. So anything that holds back the rate of any reaction is known as a limiting factor. In photosynthesis, you need to know three limiting factors. Now, they are carbon dioxide concentration, light intensity, and temperature. Now, this is something I've spoke before in another video. You need to make sure you say these words exactly. If you're asked to give a limiting factor, don't just write light. Write light intensity. Temperature is fine, but carbon dioxide concentration is also one that you need to say exactly. It's the concentration of carbon dioxide that is a limiting factor. If you think about this, it's fairly straightforward. Plants need carbon dioxide for stage two of photosynthesis. They need light for stage one of photosynthesis. And they need temperature because stage two is controlled by enzymes. And hopefully you remember that temperature is a limiting factor of enzyme activity rate. They go up to an optimum temperature, but if the temperature is too high, they can denature. So if it's freezing cold, the enzymes are not going to be working that well, and therefore the photosynthesis can be limited. So once you remember what these are, we're going to go through them one at a time and show you the graphs you can sometimes see in the exams. Carbon dioxide concentration. Again, if the carbon dioxide concentration is too low, rate of photosynthesis is too low as well. As carbon dioxide concentration increases, so does the rate of photosynthesis. This increases all the way up until, as you can see in this graph, the rate of photosynthesis starts to level off. Now, you can see at the bottom of this graph that carbon dioxide concentration is still increasing. So at that point, we know it is no longer carbon dioxide concentration that can be the limiting factor because we're giving it plenty, we're giving it more and more. Something else is holding back the reaction. You would need to know that that has to be temperature or light intensity. Quite a common exam question. If we look at light intensity, this is again something that's fairly basic. Plants need light in order to survive. If you see on a graph at light intensity, you can see here that as the light intensity increases, the rate for synthesis also increases up to a point where light intensity is still increasing, but something else is holding it back. That must be either temperature or carbon dioxide concentration. And finally, when we look at temperature, like we said, the main part, the main point of temperature being a limiting factor is because of these enzymes in stage two. As temperature increases, the rate of photosynthesis also increases until enzymes reach their optimum. So just like any other enzyme reaction, you will get this nice curve where the rate of photosynthesis will increase along with temperature until it hits their optimum point. Then it becomes denatured and the rate of reaction, the rate of activity absolutely plummets. So really that's all there is to, to photosynthesis. You need to know the two stages of photosynthesis, what happens in it, what are they called, what goes on there, what is needed. You need to know the fate of sugar, you need to know the three different ways sugar can be used. And you also need to know the three limiting factors of photosynthesis. So again, I'm going to attach uh, quizzes or, uh, or any sort of online quiz to the end of this so that you can use this, you can test your own knowledge. 
I uh, hope this breakdown of what Simpsons has been useful to you. Like I've said, it is quite a harder point of Unit 3. Okay, very best luck this. I know a lot of people are asking for these for the upcoming prelims. So very best luck for the prelims. I'll be getting the rest of these videos up as soon as possible. Thanks so much for listening.